stuff. To me, it's been really pretty. Nice, gentle rain here. Beautiful. And uh, I need to check with you, James. Are you going to put that on here? Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. We're going to begin on number 15 here. Just a minute, the back page of the last <coughs> lesson. We'll knock this all out. Time here. All right, let's bow and have a word of prayer. Begin our class. Our Holy Father, how great and good you are. How wonderful your blessings, how mighty is your word, and how magnificent is your being. You're the only God of heaven and earth, the creator of everything. Giver of rain, Father, that we've enjoyed these few days. Thank you for the replenishing of the earth and for the beauty of your creation that we see around us. Thank you for your blessings to us to give us this time tonight that we can come together and read from your word. Help us, Father, as we study these things to better equip ourselves to teach others the gospel, to bring people to you. Please forgive us when we fail you. We make many mistakes, Father, and we ask that you will be patient with us. Help us to have the strength to be patient and loving with each other. Forgive us when we don't. Pray that you will be with our families and keep them from harm and from evil in these days. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, as we had noted <clears throat> Sunday, uh, the um, friend of mine said, Why four steps to heaven? And I said, well, it, I was going to have 39 steps, but Alfred Hitchcock took that already. It's a no movie. That's an old joke. You guys have to be really old to get that. But uh, this is what we've come up with, trying to make it very simple. It's not sectarian, but we just want to make it simple for people. That's why we focus on one verse, one or two questions about that verse, and move on. By no means would this answer every question. By no means at all. But this would help us at least guide us for people who aren't comfortable or don't feel confident in teaching the Bible. This is designed to let the Bible teach itself. Here. All right, uh, question number 15 tonight here. Uh, we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. Uh, does someone have that that would like to read it? Or does someone have it that don't want to read it, but we're going to have you read it anyway? I have it. Okay, John. Thank you, sir. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. All right. Now, we'll give some background on this here in just a moment. But the question is, did first century Christians give, quote, as they prospered on the first day of the week? <coughs> the answer is, of course, yes. Now, there's a couple of things about this. One that we have mentioned already a few weeks ago, the, uh, the significance of this verse is not just that Paul is giving the directions for people to lay by in store to set aside, but the words that are used in the uh, manuscripts, it's katamion on the first every number one. Katamion, the Greek means every number one. The days of the week had numbers, one through seven. And uh, that's how they uh, marked time. And Sunday was the day number one. And what is important about this verse, that it doesn't bear out in the English as much as in the original Greek language. Paul is saying every single number one. So when people think that, well, I'll, we'll lay by a store quarterly or something of that nature, uh, Paul is telling them specifically that uh, every first day of the week when they come together, and so we see that the people of Corinth were already coming together on the first day of the week to worship God. Paul adds to that, he said, when you do that, you need to lay by a store. Now, the background on this is course that Paul was trying to gather a collection of help for the Christians who were Jews in Judea. Now the dynamic of this is very, is, is, is very important 
it's we don't see it exactly in just one verse, but overall we can get the picture. There was a famine that hit Judea. We read of that in Acts chapter 11. Agabus the prophet came and told them. Paul, <coughs> being the chosen vessel to the Gentiles, he recognizes a golden opportunity to get the Jewish Christians to be receptive to Gentile Christians. Now, as we have stated in the past, the number one obstacle to the church in the first century was Judaism. It wasn't the Roman Empire. It was the Judaizing teachers. Those were the people who were the most adamant and militant in their opposition to the gospel. And that's what Paul and the others were fighting all of the time. That is why when Paul would go into a city, his practice was always to go in to the synagogue on the Sabbath to preach to the Jews. You remember back in Romans 1, they were going to preach to the Jew first and then also the Greek. There was a significance of that in the pecking order of how the Jews having this long centuries long legacy of we're God's people. And so you're not just going to just automatically dismiss us. And Paul recognized that, of course, him being a Jew and him being uh, what some would call the super Jew. He is a Hebrew of Hebrews, taught by Gamaliel. He knew the law as well or better than anyone that lived at that time. And he was a force to be reckoned with. And now he seems to switch parties. And now he's preaching the gospel. Well, he recognized that this animosity, this ill will that some Jews still had in Jerusalem and in Judea, he could help mend, reconcile that <coughs> feeling by bringing a collection to Judea of relief for the Jews there. And uh, I had never really thought about, I mean, I knew that this was what he wanted to do. And here's, he's telling them, get your stuff, put it together, make your collection so that when I get there, we don't have to go out and get everybody here to come back together again. Uh, there was a, a an old uh, movie on a DVD that we got years ago, but it had a couple of uh, very distinguished English actors, as they all did. And, you know, I remember growing up every Easter on television, they would have uh, the story of Jesus, and I couldn't figure out why all the disciples had a British accent. <laughs> they all sounded that way. And here in looking at this, uh, they told the story of Peter and Paul. And in that movie, they have this event that happened. And Paul meets with the elders in Jerusalem. And they go down into a room, and he has a bag. And the elders in the Jerusalem uh, region are sitting there waiting for Paul. And he walks in with his bag, and he just dumps a bag load of gold on the table. And they just, their eyes get big. And I thought, that could have happened. But that surely was exchanged in some way. But what a surprise for them. Uh, that is a powerful message that Paul is making to these Jewish Christians that they have brothers who are Gentiles and they are so concerned for their welfare. This is what they're giving you. This is yours. This is a gift. You didn't ask for it. But now I'm giving it to you. They're giving it to you. And so he really was trying to press these Corinthians and say, make sure you have this, which implies that he was taking collections from several of the cities, uh, Thessalonica, Berea, etc. And when they were together, then he wanted to give it all to those Christians in Judea, which would help further reconcile there. Any, any question or, or comment about, about this going? That, that's just more background here about that. Yes, Jay? I was thinking when I was prepping for the class, I didn't know if I'd get to this one or not. And I was thinking that there's a lot of a lot of the questions that we're you know thinking about, okay, what do other churches in modern day do and maybe what does the Bible say compared to that? I was trying to think, can you think of anything that there's a modern day 
an issue with this command that, that churches have, other than maybe just people doing it wrong? Like, I, I can't think of ways that people do it wrong nowadays. I don't know. There could be all kinds of ways, okay. including that last one that you just said. I, I would imagine there one would... in mind, a major issue in mind. That you no, I, I don't. I don't. I wouldn't see this as a major issue, but it would be one that uh, Christians would need to be aware of. Right now, yeah, Barry. Generally, modern day churches pass that hat every time they meet. If it's not, they don't do it just yeah. on Sunday. If they have any rally or whatever, there's right. there's a, a basket going around. Yeah, yeah, they do. Uh, yeah, Kyle. Uh, um, Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, when it's saying like to give, now does that have to be something physically? Can it be something? If I give somebody my time during that day, could that be considered what it's stating in this, or uh, something deeper, like emotionally? Or, <coughs> yeah. You know, or does yeah. it have to be physically? Right. Well, th there there are people, matter of fact, more than probably we realize that rather than giving any physical money they in their thinking think well i'll just give my time to the lord and that should be good enough is that is that what paul is saying here now if we want to give our time to the lord that's that's good we need to do that but <laughs> the passage that we're looking at is not talking about i'll pitch in you know a few hours labor to help you here help it, it, it it's a physical collection of funds that he can take to Jerusalem um, and uh, I it, it, it worries me uh, at times when Christians try to rationalize and well I'm not going to give that much money but I'll just give something else I'll teach a class or I'll mow the yard or I'll clean the lot or I'll paint or something like that and that will be my contribution to the Lord the uh, problem with that is that's not what Paul is <coughs> talking about there. Yes, I did. Um, I think kind of the question might spur what if you don't have to give? What if you don't have money to give, but you do have service to give? What if you want to give money, but it's hard enough to make ends meet? So if you want to give your service, you want to be there to help other people, but there might not be a monetary contribution. Like, does that come into play at all? Because there are some people here and there that might not be able to afford, but that is what the church is for um, as well, to be able to rely on, to help each other. But if you're along the means where you can't give monetary, should you be guilted into feeling that you should be able to cop something up? Well, that can be easily answered in the verse itself. This is what we train ourselves to look at the actual, let's look at the verse, verse two there. What is the key phrase in that verse that Paul says that will tell us how much and what to give? John, my version says to the extent that God has blessed you. Has he blessed me with 50 bucks? Has he blessed me with 50,000 bucks? They're both different, but they're both a blessing. And there is a portion there from that blessing that Paul is telling us as we were prospered, we need to give from that. Yes, Stacey? And I think a lot of times we look at it as we give what we have left over after we yes. pay all our bills and stuff instead of thinking God gets the first fruits. That, that is a powerfully important point. Thank you, Stacy. In the Old Testament, what did they sacrifice? The first fruits. First fruits of the harvest, first of the flock. And it was to be the best. And when they didn't do that, Malachi chapter 1, just go home and read that tonight. Malachi chapter 1, the last book in the Old Testament. Uh, the prophet just blisters the people for what they're doing and trying to rationalize what they don't want to give. I, I just, uh, <laughs> I, you know, when you're 14, you're, you're pretty impressionable. And there was an 18-year-old boy in the congregation where I grew up that had just graduated. He was in college and he had a job and so in the eyes of a 14 year old, he's a big guy. And uh, he asked if, hey, let's go camping out north of Phoenix <clears throat> at the Verde. And my parents said yes, which to me was just, you know, 
wow, I get to go out, you know, this is a big deal. Well, we start to go out and he stops to get gas in his 58 Chevy and he pulls his wallet out. And when he pulled his wallet out, he stopped and he said, well, I got this right here. He said, I got some money, I get. But he said, here, and he pulled out a folded up $20 bill, which was pretty big in 1965, 66. And he says, this is from my paycheck. He said, I cash my check and the first thing I do is I take $20 full up and I stick it right in there and that's the Lord's. I don't touch it. And I said, really? Wow, that's cool. One of the best lessons I got was from a friend that uh, was up here. It was not from a Bible class teacher or a school teacher or a parent or, or someone like that. <clears throat> and, that and, and he put that list and he has, he has been a... Uh, extraordinary source of influence for people for decades and decades and decades. He's visited here before. You don't know that, but he visited here. Uh, any, anyone else about that? Yeah, Barry? Well, when we studied the, uh, the widow's might, it emphasizes that it's not the amount of money that is given, but that there's something about giving from what you have <laughs> right. that you've been prospered. She didn't have anything, yeah. but she was required to give. The other things, though, are all good gifts, too. It's just not what this verse is talking about. I mean, those are, we're told to edify each other. We're told to support each other. We're told to help each other. But all those things are, are important. But that's just not what this is talking about. That There's something great. about sacrificing what you've got. Right. The widow's mind is a powerful story. What you just said, the edifying and encouraging, etc. That's needed, too, but not in place of right. what we're talking about right here. Julie? going to say in times when he did not have very much money and did not think that we could shoe our children and, and feed them and all that we still gave but it was a very small portion but it felt better to do that than to try to rationalize why we couldn't give that just that'll kind of crush your soul yes you know you're, you're kind of if, if you're saying i can't give anything I'm not, you know, there's no tithing. There's just what you can give. I can't give anything. If you say that, you're, you know, you're pulling away from God and you're not doing what you're supposed to. That's right. So that's I would rather give a quarter if that's what I've got. If, if, if that's all I can do, then, then at least your heart is giving something as opposed to that withholding. And I need this. And I, it's, it, it just pretty much changes how your heart yeah. feels about your relationship with God. It's a rotten feeling when you don't get that. And one other thing, let me just, uh, basically, uh, a synopsis of several things that's already been said about this, is that whatever we give, it has to be planned ahead of time. I have determined. I have looked at this. I see what I've prospered. And now this is the Lord, the first fruits. It's not, well, I'm going to get through the week and then I don't know if I got anything <coughs> left. You know, here's what I have left, Lord. Ooh, that is the wrong approach. That's Malachi chapter one. We give him first. And then if we can't uh, do some things, we just do without. But Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. He's going to provide a way. And it just... It just happens that way, and it's a wonderful thing when it does. Okay, was there another hand here, so John? We're just gonna reemphasize the lesson you learned from from an older brother. Is yeah, that money was still in his wallet, but he intentionally didn't keep it with the rest of the money. He set it aside. So lay by and then store. That's right. It's it's aside. Right. <clears throat> you know, it, it, Probably didn't have a bank account or we didn't got paid, whatever. But here he was, he set it aside knowing that that was not coming out until Sunday. Right. That's, that's right. That's in principle, uh, that's how we all are. I'll tell you just one thing, just in, in, in a side note. It was mentioned in the deacons meeting here last month or so. Um, this is the first time that uh, Dewey and I have ever been in a situation where we have signed up with Venmo or whatever this is, 
so that it automatically takes our contribution out every week. And because uh, it's, it's nice, you know, not to have to worry about because that was, oh, I forgot to write the check. It's already taken care of. Uh, <laughs> there have been a few times when I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, good. Oh, that was taken care of. I got a notice from here. And uh, is that any different than paying my water bill? And, and I'm not, this is for no one else but just me. Occasionally I've thought, maybe I need to give this some more thought. It's easy to sign up <clears throat> to give to the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong. Of course, many of us, we take advantage of that in the, in the wonderful age of technology that we live in. But I hope the Lord recognizes that we want to make sure because I don't want to lose, lose sight of that. Maybe I, you know what, I just decided, well, maybe I have just, <coughs> I'll do it now and talk about that. <laughs> <coughs> Any other questions? <laughs> All right, okay, uh, now the next one here is 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. We'll have two here. <clears throat> First Corinthians 4th chapter and uh, verse 6. Anyone like to read that? Robert, thank you. And these things, brethren, I have in future a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that ye may learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up one against another. All right. Okay. Now we'll hold that thought. We'll turn to the last book, Revelation, and chapter 22. Bob? Okay. I warn everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, I will add to that person the plague described in the scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in the scroll. All right, we have three questions here with these two thoughts. First one, does God want anything added to his word? Absolutely not. Does God want anything taken from his word? Uh, uh, of course not. Uh, then the third question, can we be pleasing to God if we add cake to the Lord's Supper or piano to our singing? Now, those are not hypotheticals. Those are, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that has happened in some places. The answer to that, of course, we cannot be pleasing to him if we add these things. Now, uh, uh, one caveat here to uh, Revelation 22 Uh some have, and I, I, I have no argument with people who look at this and say, well, the, the interpretation or application, I should say, of Revelation 22 and the command and warning that's given there not to add to or take away is strictly for that book. And that might be, uh, I, I don't know. The, certainly the warning was in the Old Testament, but here in the passage that we read in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, when Paul said that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Look right in the middle of that verse. Verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. That you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Now, tell me what that means. Stacey? I think when people change or add or think your your arrogance is thinking that you know more than god right. if god's telling us what to do he's telling us how to worship oh but i know better so this is what we need to do yeah that that point cannot be overstated particularly in the world that we live in today <clears throat> where many thoughts about the bible begin with well i think I feel, you just, just note that, you just kind of keep a, put your antenna up for the future this year, wherever we're at, whatever circumstance when people talk about the Bible. See how many times people begin with, well, I feel, or I think. Do you think those words would ever be uttered by a person who is standing in front of God? 
That, 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 this, is, this is Paul saying, I want you to make sure that you do not think above that which is written or beyond it. Okay, there, uh, yeah, Ruben and then John. Just real quick, we have a lot of translations of the Bible, and like the New Living Translation kind of simplifies the, the reading. Right, of it. correct. But you have a concern in the back of my head, that's it. Should I be reading a New King James version, or, the, or, or you know, <laughs> like the Apostle Paul did? <laughs> should I be reading in Hebrew? I mean, you know, <clears throat> you down to the core of it. It's just I wonder how, how much of a shift there is, and it's really hard to tell by, you know, the way well, you're that that that's one of the advantages of reading more than one translation. Now, I know we have some translations I know that I like to teach from, but we also recognize that there are other translations. And they are not different ideas. They are just the same principle <clears throat> or idea that may be worded in a different way, using a few different words. But the beauty of that, and, and, and we don't have to be Greek scholars that don't have to do that. But the beauty of that is there are books out there, there are English Greek interlinears that you can read the Greek word and see the English equivalent that is taken from the major text. And so you can do more than just get a sense of what the text is saying. You can understand exactly what it is saying. The problem is, and I say problem, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, in modern day vernaculars, the syntax changes with people and we use slightly different words sometimes. Uh, I remember when I was just 12 years old, we went and played a little league game, and I came back to my grandmother. You know, how do you know? I said, oh, man, we creamed them. <laughs> and she got so tickled. She'd never heard that before. What do you mean? She creamed corn. <laughs> she, she didn't cream baseball games. <clears throat> oh, no, we just creamed. And that's the vernacular. Cleave. Uh, a meat cleaver. You know, what does it do? Cleave means to separate. No. Uh, in Genesis 2, you cleave to your wife. So in, in times, words can mean sometimes the exact opposite of, of, one, of one another. And so I would say to you, Reuben, that, uh, you know, we can get different translations, but when we read those, we get the idea. And the problem that people have that Stacy's talking about said, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but I've got another idea that we can plug that in. That's when we're going to break through the ice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was someone here first, John, and then Robert, and then Kyle, and then Isaiah, and then whoever's in the holler. <laughs> okay, John. Well, one of the beautiful things about using the phone is it has this wonderful compare feature. Yeah. Yeah. So like King James, which I don't ever use except for instances like this, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above which is written. The men and their ideas, right? Their interpretations, their philosophy. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's, it's good to have it in form, but I, I have the same thing on my phone. Yeah, I have the comparison of those two. Robert, I think this kind of ties into what we were talking about before about the the adding instruments and in music to the right. mm -hmm. service, and I, I think it goes back to our our doctrine and our belief that we speak where the Bible speaks. And we're silent when the Bible is silent. And if we can't believe this, then we don't have any salvation. That's right. And if we can't accept that, we're going to be forever adrift in an ocean of opinion. And people are drowning in that ocean of opinion everywhere to this day. Okay, uh, Kyle and then Isaiah, and then, uh, then Keith. Kyle? No? Okay, so I'm going to be like totally off with this question, but just bear with me, okay? So on uh, question 15, when we were at question 15, we were discussing about giving something and, uh, you know, giving money, you know, and stuff like that. So um, you were given on the first day, right? So I understand that question, but then we're talking about if something, like, would it be displeasing if somebody did bring a piano? Like, if we're giving money, that's not displeasing, but it's actually a good thing on the first day. But if somebody gives a piano, per se, like, is that displeasing, or is it, would it be considered displeasing? 
Yeah, what if somebody, somebody did do that? You mean to physically give a gift of a piano? Yeah. Which some have done in the past, in the 1800s. Uh, well, what would, would they do with that piano? Uh, I guess play it while you sing. Okay. <laughs> well, mean, then if they began to play it, uh, when we were studying last Sunday about uh, the command was to sing and make melody in your heart, would a piano fit in there? No. No, it wouldn't. So, so yeah, that's how that, that principle is here. We be, we're now adding to the, the word. That's right. Isaiah? I actually had a discussion about this with someone the other night, and it was a long discussion, but she was taught that she let men's doctrine get to her first, which is basically they're not smart enough to figure out what the Bible says. Repeat that. I'm sorry, Isaiah. She's, <clears throat> she's taught that we aren't smart enough to figure out what the Bible says for ourselves, okay. so we need people to give us doctrine right. and help each other learn. And <coughs> I, I said it's all here, like there's so much of it, this is all we need. I mean, we need to help each other understand it, and sometimes, you know, we need help figuring out what it means, but we don't need to build off of it. It says in there, you're a curse if you take or add it away from it. Um, take away from it or add to it, I mean. So people are being taught that, oh, you're not smart enough to know what this means because you didn't go to seminary. So you need to do what I say. That's right. And and actually, that that thought that that young lady expressed is centuries old. Uh, anyone want to take a guess where that thought was first introduced to the world? Catholic. Exactly. The Catholic Church, the Bible was in Latin, and they thought the people are too ignorant to read it and understand it. So that's why not only did they keep the Bible in Latin, they kept the Mass in Latin so that the people didn't know. And if they had any question about what the Bible said, what were they supposed to do? Ask the priest. What? Ask the priest. Ask the priest. Because he's their connection with God. So that, that, is, that is centuries old. Uh, that God would reveal a cryptic message that only a few people could decipher. Oh my. <laughs> All right, Keith? Uh, I know you're, you're trying not to get too far off from. It's all right, we got time. It's raining. <laughs> <laughs> no rush. I'll say that. I'll go over the next 40 minutes. <laughs> well, well, man, the rain's going to stop here. <laughs> uh, just. <clears throat> We, we, it's such a growth process spiritually, right. learning what scriptures say and applying them. And in the things we're speaking about tonight, giving up our financial needs and adding to or taking away from God's word. The one thing that we've talked a lot about over the weeks and the months is Matthew 7 21. And not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, or in the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth my will. And those two words, three words, he that, he that does my will are so important and that we constantly should be on guard and yet learning what God's will is in our life and how to apply it. And, and I have to think about how subtle was the change for Nadab and Abihu. In, in Leviticus 10, right? The, they, they offered a strange fire. And I don't know, but I'm thinking, well, I'll bet that fire felt the same. I'll bet it looked the same. And I'll bet it accomplished the same thing. No, it didn't. It didn't because God said it was strange fire. It wasn't what he had commanded. And, that, and we are great as humans. We are great at justifying things. Oh my goodness. Oh, God couldn't possibly uh, be displeased with this offer. This won't matter to God. It's not that big of a deal. Oh, really? Okay, there was another hand up here somewhere. I, I don't want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Okay, all right. Uh, we'll go to the next one here, number 17. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 8. <clears throat> this one uh, is going to take a little time to look at because... There's, a, uh, some, yeah, there's an answering nuance here of the words here. 
Uh, anyone have that verse, Galatians 1, uh, 8? I'd like to read that with us. Okay, Jerry. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one who preached to you, let him be accursed. All right, go ahead and read verse 9 too. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to, what, to the one you received, let him be accursed. All right, okay. The, uh, the dynamic or background behind this is that Galatia is a, is a region. It's the region in the middle of <coughs> modern-day Turkey, uh, Asia Minor. And Paul had previously gone there and had preached the gospel and had established several churches in Galatia. And when he established them, got them going, and he moved on, but then he got word that the Judaizing teachers, that is, those men who put the old law first before the gospel, followed him into that region and they got a hold of those people and said, no, 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 no. Uh, you have to be a Jew first. Then you can become a Christian. You can't just become a Christian right out of a Gentile world. You have to be ushered into the Christian world as a Jew. And so they were forcing the men to be circumcised and for the people to keep the law. Then they could be Christians. And when Paul got wind of that, he said, whoa, 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 time out. Dude. I never taught anything like that. And he says, now I hear that you are following another gospel that he says, in verse eight, which is not another. And it sounds contradictory, but what he is doing is he uses two different Greek words, another of the same kind, as opposed to another of a different kind. It would be like this. Now I... Let's eat apples. Okay, we're going to eat gala apples. Someone says, no, I'd like to eat Macintosh. Okay, apple is an apple is an apple. Okay, that's another of the same kind. No problem there. But now they come along and say, no, we're going to eat oranges. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's not an apple. That is not a fruit of the same kind. That is a fruit of another kind. And that is what he is saying about this twisted, perverted message that the Judaizing teachers are now forcing on the Galatians and that they have accepted. Well, yeah, we've got to be Jews first, then we can become a Christian. And Paul was saying, what are you doing? No. And he was worried that all his work would be in vain. Now, here are the two questions about this. If anyone preaches a gospel that is not taught in the New Testament, will they be accursed by God? The answer is yes. So people can say all kinds of things and you can put a label on something, but that doesn't mean that's what it is. They can put, oh yeah, now our teaching is, but it's still the gospel of Christ. Okay, uh, I got a truck out there. I'm going to go get a Lamborghini badge, and I'm going to stick that Lamborghini right on the front of that, that truck, on the grill. Yeah, hey, you guys see my new Lamborghini? Said, that's just an old truck. That's not a Lamborghini. Well, it says so right there. No, no, no. It doesn't matter what you put on that or what you call it or title it, it's not the same thing. And that's what they have done with the gospel of Christ. And that's what Paul is talking about here. And so the next question, since our soul depends upon what you obey, would you want anyone to teach you anything other than what can be read in the Bible? Well, there's a question that they have to answer for themselves. Now, we know what that answer is for us, but in a private Bible study at the kitchen table when we've got this out here they, they have to answer this for themselves. That, that's the objective of these four lessons so that people can look at this and not be told what to do because we, we don't want to tell anyone what to do. Uh, we want them to read it from God's word and let God's word direct them and then they come to a question like this. They have to make a decision about that. Uh, I could take that Lamborghini badge, stick it on that truck, and then put it in the classified ad and say, I've got a Lamborghini here that I'll, I'll sell you for $9,000. Whoa, really? A Lamborghini? Yeah, can they come on out and they look at it? They say, here you go. And they go, that's not a Lamborghini. Oh, yes, it is. It says so right there on the grill. <laughs> that's a truck. Uh, well, would you buy that Lamborghini for me? Yeah, let's see. You see how, how absurd this becomes, that the world has all 
manner of philosophies and teachings that they will pawn off on the world as from God. There's Paul said in Ephesians 4, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And one buzzer or two? One. one. <laughs> All right, any question about uh, what was it? Yeah, James? <coughs> I think we need to be, I agree with you, I, I think we need to be careful, though, that we stick to what the Bible says and, and not go into maybe what the churches of Christ have traditionally taught or what yes. our traditions have been. Yes. To use your example, yeah. you know, Ben Remedy a few years ago came out with an S&P. And people said, that's not an S&P. Well, Lamborghini says it's a Lamborghini, and it's got a V10, and it goes real fast. So what makes a Lamborghini a Lamborghini? It, is it because it has to be a, a short, fast sports car? Is that the only thing that can be a Lamborghini? Or a Lamborghini decides our SUV that goes real, real fast. That's a Lamborghini. And I, I bring that example up because I think people can have honest disagreements, and they can say, Honest Bible students can have honest disagreements and say, I think the Bible says this. And someone else can say, I think the Bible says that. Sometimes there's dishonest people, and there's plenty of those out there who are just throwing away whatever, or they won't even read the Bible. But I think there are scriptures that we'll, you know, we can look at and go, I, I see it differently. I don't see a lot of commands to then you know, get away from those people. And I think that's one area where, especially the Church of Christ, has had a big problem of, well, you, you believe this, and I see this text here, and I go, it comes down to the gospel. You're preaching another gospel. That's, that's a curse. If you're preaching, do we need to have a fellowship hall? What color the carpet is? You know, how many songs do we have? There's a lot of teachings that Church of Christ has split over, I think, sadly, that should not have ever been split over. We get to, I think this, and I can't stand you, so I'm not. Yeah. Let, let me just repeat what I think I've said when I started this. I'm giving you a lot of background information just for our benefit. I'm not telling you what to say in a Bible class. The Bible class should be very simple, straightforward. Read the question, answer it, let them think about it, and move on. Yeah, we're not here. One friend of mine said, uh, I'm not even going to entertain any questions. I'll tell the people, look, we're going to go through this, and at the end, then we'll entertain questions. But we want to keep focused on just the text. So th that, that is right. We don't, we don't want to get off in these tangents about, well, there's history here and history there. The only reason I'm doing it is for our benefit in this class. But uh, uh, when we use this, we want to stick really close to the script. Uh, and let the Bible do its own teaching. All right, any other question on that? Okay, uh, I think, that, yeah, Bill? Um, so when they say, just so I'm clarifying. Sure. When it says, if anyone preaches a different gospel, can that also mean, you know, let's say, um, Book of Mormon, Jehovah's Witness Bible, and all that? Yes. That also applies yeah, to Yeah, good point. That's right, okay. that's right. Good. Lot, lots of teachings, quote unquote, out there that will be passed off as the gospel, but it doesn't come close to the New Testament message of being saved by faith. Okay, is there someone else there? Okay, all right. Um, I'll tell you what. We're going to just stop right there. Uh, Eighteen. We'll we'll have to get into that Sunday morning, uh, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to wrap this up and then uh, sometime this next week or next Sunday uh, we're going to be able to start our. Uh, uh, our study on judges here, but uh, so far so good. Uh, thank you for your good attention. We'll uh, leave it right there.
That's a step. <laughs> oh, am I? Uh, is that you sure that's not the one I need? <laughs>
worshiping God with us. It's good to see everybody as always. I just have a couple of announcements. There was an email sent out about Carol and Joe Garifaldi's grandson, Luca, who broke his femur in his leg. So if we could keep them in our prayers. And little Luca, he's been through a lot, that little boy. So let's keep him in our prayers that he gets healthy. And then also about Angie's mom and the lung cancer. We can just keep her in our prayers. Alicia had to move to another facility. But it's, uh, it's a hard thing to go through with a parent. So if we could keep them both in our prayers, it would be greatly appreciated. So as we have services tonight, Bill Gold will give us our talk. Mark will lead us in our song. And Jeff Powell has our closing prayers. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Okay, here's a trivia question. Does anybody know how many people died in the Spanish flu? I looked it up, I cheated. Okay, so in America, 675,000 people died in the Spanish flu. Worldwide, it was 21 million people. The Spanish flu was before anybody knew about germs or viruses. They had some theories, but they hadn't seen them yet. That didn't come until like 1929. So, you know, the Bible says knowledge will set you free, right? Well, talking about the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but on colleges, uh, they're talking about education. So what happens when we found out about um, germs and viruses, and then we had our own little disease? Everybody got scared and panicked and uh, went and hid in the corner. It was terrible. I hated it. I, I saw a television one time when I went home from work and I thought after a half hour I was going to die. I thought that was going to die on the way to work and on the way to work, I thought, oh, it's going to kill me dead. So guess what? One of the problems we've had even in our congregation is that we separated in, the, in, the, in our services. For a long, long time our services were online. Then we did them in the backyard. And then, and then when we did come in, we, oh, stay six feet apart and wear your mask and blah, blah, blah. And then we changed the way we did things a lot. Like we still have vestiges of the pandemic. For instance, on the Lord's Supper, the little things that we take in the plastic bag, that's a vestige of the pandemic. We don't pass the collection plate around. That's a vestige of the pandemic. You know, if you want to, uh, Donate, you got to go back there. Well, what about little kids that need to learn about giving to, to God? You know, that's one of the major things passing the plate does is teach little children. Hey, it's not all about me. It's about God. It's about giving. It's about helping other people. So, some talk has already been going around and we need, <coughs> I firmly believe this, we got to get rid of that pandemic thought and get away from it and start worshiping the way we need to worship without fear. And so um, I just want to just say that so that maybe you could think about it too and go, hey, do we really want to continue doing things that are uh, a holdover from a pandemic time, a holdover of fear, because I, I personally don't want any. And so, um, that's why I'm saying this. So, and that with in mind too, another thing that I'd like to bring up is that uh, it would be really, really good to have more people help with the services. So, if you're not helping in services, then think of what Paul says in... Um, Romans 12, starting in verse uh, 5, says, So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophecy, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If 
If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So I like to think of the serving part because that's probably one of the easiest things that we can do. If you're not a teacher, if you're not a leader, if you're not a generous, well, you could be one of the people that help pass the plate. You could be one of the people that help pass the Lord's Supper. You could be one of the people come up here and talk and then everybody goes, what was he saying? <laughs> <laughs> so it's something that you really need to think about if you're not doing that. Talk to me because I make the schedule and I can put you on the schedule in a heartbeat real fast. Like that. Ask Mark Concha. He just got back. <laughs> He's already helping all right, so anyway, that's what I'd like to uh, talk about. So talk amongst yourselves about what I'm talking about. Thank you. Bye. Not bye. Okay, next. <laughs> Let's be standing as we sing this song. As the risen Savior, we sing in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever they may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me, alone I stare away. shine in the world and bring others to know your son. Please be with us always in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah.